This is John 15 verses 1 to 17. I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes, so that it will be even more fruitful. You're already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me, as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself, it must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, and you are the branches. If you remain in me, and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you're like a branch that's thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain in me, and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I've kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I've told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You're my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant doesn't know what his father's, what his master's business is. Instead, I've called you friends. For everything I learned from my father, I've made known to you. You didn't choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. And so whatever you ask in my name, the father will give you. This is my command. Love each other. It's New Year's Day 2023. It's the start of a new year. I've heard people say that they're glad to see the back of 2022 and they're looking forward to this new year. But in spite of the many predictions easily found on social media, none of us really knows what will happen this year. We don't know if it's going to be better or worse than 2022. But we don't need to anxiously search through YouTube trying to find the most reliable prophetic messages to weigh them up. God will continually speak to us through his Holy Spirit and through our Christian brothers and sisters in our local church and he's already spoken to us clearly about the times we live in through the Bible which is his living and active word. Here's my summarized prediction for 2023 based on what the Bible tells us. You will have many troubles, but also many blessings, even at the same time, if you continue walking closely with Jesus. That's actually what John 15 tells us as well, but it also tells us, obviously, a lot more. It expands on uh, those ideas. It tells us God wants us to be in the place where he can bless us, where there will be many blessings, and it reveals God's loving heart towards us, because it's because of God's love for us that Jesus Jesus urges us to remain in him, to stay in that safe place where we will and can be, can be and will be blessed, a place of blessing. In spite of anything that may happen in the world around us, that can still be true for us. And these verses from John 15 give us a challenge, a challenge for us to accept and a choice for us to make. That's what Jesus presents us with here, and he makes the consequences of how we respond very clear to us. What kind of year this will be for each one of us will differ depending on how we respond to Jesus's warnings and the choices that he lays out for us in these verses. His invitations in verse four, remain in me as I also remain in you. And it comes with a clear reason. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. And as Jesus talks about that, he tells us the good things which will be experienced by those who remain in him and the negative experiences of those who refuse to remain in him. In him is life itself, just as there's life for branches only when they're connected to the vine. The life-giving properties of Jesus are continuous They're continual. Life flows from him to those who are connected to him, those living in a relationship with him. This is a foundational and essential truth for us to understand as we look ahead to the coming year. 
we may wonder as we look ahead if we've got enough resources to face each day. And the answer to that is no. No, we don't have enough resources in ourselves to face any day of this coming year. Our inner and external resources will soon run out. Let me give you an example. If you lose your job or if you quit your job, your source of income stops and you probably look at your bank balance and wonder how long you can manage with money that you've got left. We need a regular supply of income coming in to keep our bank balances topped up as we spend money out of them. And that's it's only so long that we can exist and live on credit alone before we face total financial collapse. You've got to have money coming in for money to continue going out. And that's true of our spiritual life as well. Jesus tells us that without him, we can do nothing. And that's because we have no spiritual life apart from him. Nothing coming in. But in Jesus, there's a continual spiritual supply. His spiritual riches flow without fail. They never run dry. In him, there's fresh grace every day, sufficient for all our needs. When Jesus tells us in John chapter 6 that he's the bread of life, he also reminds us of the way that the Israelites ate manna in the desert. They learned not to collect it and hoard it up. When they tried to save some for another day, it went bad. They could only eat it fresh on the day that it appeared. And they had to trust God for fresh manna for the next day and fresh manna for the day after that. And God never failed to supply the bread that they needed every day. In the same way, we can trust Jesus to supply us with all that we need each day. We don't need to look ahead with a fear of what may happen because we can always look to Jesus each day and we'll always find in him what we need for that day. Here in John 15, Jesus promises those who remain in him a deep intimacy with himself. He refers to remaining in him as remaining in his love. And to those who thought of themselves as his servants, he calls friends. Friends because he's shared and continues to share his heart and plans with them. There's also an increase in power for those who remain in Jesus. He tells us about an extraordinary level of answered prayer. Those who are truly remaining in him, those allowing his word to inform and transform their lives, will be able to ask whatever they want of Jesus, verse 7 says, and it will be done for you. Whatever he asks for in his name, verse 16 says, will be given to you by the Father. And there's an increase in fruitfulness, an increasing fruitfulness. Those who remain in Jesus will bear fruit. They will bear more fruit and they will bear much fruit. And all this will be lasting fruit. In Jesus, we produce things that are of eternal consequences, those things which will endure and have real value when we stand before the throne of God and the books are opened, those things which will still matter when nothing else at all matters anymore. 1 Corinthians 3, 12 to 15 says, If anyone builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay or straw, their work, work will be shown for what it is because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire and the fire will test the quality of each person's work. If what has been built survives, the builder will receive a reward. If it's burned up, the builder will suffer loss, but yet will be saved, even though only as one escaping through the flames. All these things promised by Jesus to those who remain in him can be ours no matter what this year brings, but we've got a choice. Jesus doesn't force himself on us. He invites us to remain in him. And we can choose to remain in him or not. The choice we have is um, like the choice that is illustrated so well in Psalm 1. Blessed is the one who doesn't walk in the step with, in step with the wicked or stand in the way of, that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on his law day and night. That person's like a tree planted by streams of water which yield its fruit in season and whose leaf doesn't wither. Whatever they do prospers. Not so the wicked, they're like chaff that the wind blows away. Therefore the wicked won't stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked leads to destruction. There's blessings and 
cursings listed here. Choices and consequences, a good life and a dreadful life that are laid out before us. And in spite of having this type of choice spelled out to them very clearly over and over again, God's people have often chosen to ignore what God's been saying and to ignore what's been offered to them and to, and the warnings uh, against turning away from him. And they turn away from him and they go their own way. Throughout the Bible, we read that God looked for fruit from his people and he didn't find any. Uh, Jeremiah describes the terrible choice God's people often make. Jeremiah 2, 12 to 13, be appalled at this, you heavens, and shudder with great horror, declares the Lord. My people have committed two sins. They've forsaken me, the spring of living water, and have dug their own cisterns, broken cisterns that cannot hold water. There's two sins here, sins which are closely related to each other. Firstly, forsaking God, turning away from the spring of living water. And secondly, trying to create our own source of life-giving refreshment. It's the attitude that says, I don't need you, God. I can manage perfectly well without you. But these verses remind us that what we dig for ourselves can only ever be a broken and leaky cistern. It will prove to be a source that can never satisfy us, a source that will continually run dry. Remember, remember the contrasting statement Jesus made to the woman at the well. This is John 4, 14. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. In Jesus, we find a continually life-giving source of refreshment and life, which continues into eternity. That's why Jesus, motivated by love for us, says, remain in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. You have to remain in me to have this life-giving water flowing through your life. But Jesus also warns us uh, that it's costly to remain in him. He gives us reasons why we may not want to remain in him. He wants to he wants us to enter into this relationship and stay connected with him with our eyes wide open. He wants us to count the cost. Some Christians seem surprised when they face difficulties as if something strange was happening to them. But here Jesus specifically warns us about two difficulties that we're going to face if we choose to follow him. One comes from God and the other comes from the world. Verse 2 warns us about the process of pruning. He, that's God, the Father, cuts off every branch in Jesus that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes so that it will be more fruitful. And in verses 18 to 19, we have this warning about persecution or being hated by the world. If the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first, says Jesus. If you belong to the world, it would love you as its, as its own. But it is as it is, you do not belong to the world, but I've chosen you out of the world. That's why the world hates you. When we're grafted into Jesus and his life flows through us, we carry the fragrance of Christ, which is associated with the cross, the willingness to lay down our lives for others. It's the fragrance of life to some, those who will willingly receive Jesus. And it's the fragrance of death to others, those who will perish because they choose to reject him. By remaining in Jesus and allowing his command to love each other as he's loved us, to transform us, we invite hatred from those who also hate Jesus. Jesus makes it clear that this is part of the choice. Do you want to be friends with him or do you want to be friends with those who reject him? You can't have both. And as we accept the challenge to follow Jesus and to love as he loves, we soon find out that there's a lot about us that isn't like Jesus. A lot in us that rebels against living our lives in a way that prefers the interests of other people to our own. That's why even when we have chosen to follow Jesus, even when we've said yes to him, even when we've started to bear some fruit, we still need a lot of pruning. Perhaps you've noticed that your need for pruning in yourself more around Christmas time when perhaps there's more people around, perhaps there's a change of routine and different kinds of stresses on your life. Perhaps you've noticed some negative feelings, thoughts and responses rising up in you. Or perhaps that was what you noticed uh, during a more normal working week. When people rub us up the wrong way, it's something that's 
wrong in us, which is getting stirred up and highlighted. And it's those attitudes which the Father wants to cut out of our lives so that we become more like Jesus, and as a consequence, even more fruitful. And Jesus warns us, you can't remain in him without having that process take place. If we didn't have to walk with Jesus, if we didn't have to live with the spirit of truth in us, if we didn't have to obey his command to love each other, then we could do whatever we like. Ignore our bad attitudes, our judgmental thoughts. But choosing to remain in Jesus means we're opening up our lives to a holy God. We're letting him decide what's acceptable and what's not acceptable in our lives. Saying yes to Jesus is like signing a waiver that allows him to perform whatever tree surgery he chooses to carry out on us. Walking with Jesus can be a painful process of self-discovery and surrender, of wrestling with God like Jacob who wanted to manipulate life to fit his own desires rather than to surrender to God's sovereignty and grace. But we've been given this heads up by Jesus, a warning and an invitation so that we can make an informed decision to choose what is best and to commit to it before those battles and struggles come. And in spite of these very real warnings, he's still offering us the very best way to live, far above any other possible option. This is the only way to experience what Jesus calls elsewhere, the abundant life or life in all its fullness. And here in these verses, he talks about our joy being complete. And this is the only way for us to experience eternal life. Isn't this the perfect time of year to commit ourselves afresh to remaining in Jesus? To make an informed decision, eyes wide open, to connect or reconnect with him. Knowing that remaining in Jesus will attract hatred from some people. Knowing that remaining in Jesus means we're committing ourselves to loving each other unreservedly. And to having our lives examined by and pruned by God the Father. But also knowing that remaining in Jesus means we get to know him as an intimate friend. That he will share his heart and his plans with us and that we can open up our hearts to him. That he will hear our prayers and that he will answer our prayers. That he'll be to us a never-ending stream of life-giving water. That we will in him produce much fruit. Fruit that will last and be of eternal value. I do hope and pray that you're able to receive Jesus's wonderful invitation with excitement, with a sense of great expectation and with joy. And that the words from 2 Kings 19 verse 30 spoken to Hezekiah will also be true for you this year. 2 Kings 19 30 says, once more a remnant of the kingdom of Judah will take root below and bear fruit above. This year, throughout this year, may you and I be just like that remnant, below deeply rooted in Jesus and above bearing much fruit.